in the Old Testament, the book of Judges. Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel. Judges chapter 15, where we'll find our reading for the message. We have been in a series of messages for some time on men who rocked the world. And today we come to Samson who is found camping on the rock. Judges chapter 15. If you found your place, say amen. amen. Have you ever wondered why people disappoint you? For instance, there is a sports star. All you know about him is that he is some more kind of athlete. He can do just about anything and you think that he can do nothing wrong but then one day on television or in the newspaper you get a report of what he's done to destroy your belief in your sports idol. Why in the world would a man do some of the stupid things that they do? Some of you parents, you love your child, you've brought them up to be right and to do right, and yet they do some things that just breaks your heart. And you look at that and you wonder why in the world did they do something so silly, so stupid as that. And then some of you look at your own life and you see some of the decisions that you made that have wrecked your testimony, ruined your life, perhaps destroyed the faith that people have in you and you look at yourself and you wonder why in the world did I ever act so stupidly? Well, we have the kind of, that kind of man described in Samson. If you ask the average person in the world today who is the strongest man in the world, they'd say, Samson. If they were, you were to ask, who is the man that uh, destroyed his enemies in his death? They'd say Samson. Because Samson was a hero of the faith. Samson was a hero of the people. Now, as opposed to some others, I do not personally believe that he was a great, big, muscular man. Now, the reason I say that is because the scripture says he only performed his works of great uh, strength when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And so I want you to know that even a midget with the power of God on him is a strong man. And you, with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, become a dynamo in the hands of holy God. So Samson may have looked like some of us, just an ordinary looking guy. But for whatever reason, he became strong when the Lord came upon him. But as you look at Samson's life, we're drawn to his strength. But if you examine it, he's got more weaknesses and more failures than he does strength or victory. And so we need to examine this scripture today and try to find out in our own world why Samson failed like he did. And of course, the first thing that I note is that he failed because his flesh reigned instead of God reigning in his life. That's the evidence of his weakness. He yielded himself to his flesh which indicated or indicates that he is weak in character. Now, here is a man who should have been sterling in his character, but rather he is weak in his character. This is revealed, you see, in his weakness with women. Now, Samson had a problem. Samson 
apparently looked at himself and thought, hey, I am God's answer to women. If you've ever known somebody like that, say amen. amen. Yeah, we've seen a few in our lifetime. Some of you have been married to him. And... Uh, <laughs> Samson had a problem with women. Everywhere you look, he's running into trouble because of his problem with women. The first one that I see is that Samson saw a woman down at Timnath and he said, boy, I like her. She's good looking. Matter of fact, I want to marry her. He goes home to daddy and he says, daddy, go get me that woman. Now things were different then. Daddy could just go down and pay a dowry. And if the guy agreed, then uh, you could marry. So he said, I want that woman. Daddy said, boy, have you lost your mind? Now that's not in the King James Version. That's in the King Jones Version. But he said, son, don't you know? Don't you know? There's plenty of women of our own people, of the Israelites. Stay away from the Philistines. And son, he said, no, sir. I want that woman. Get her for me. Well, he's weak when it comes to women. That's evidenced also in the fact that even after that, he falls into the clutches of a prostitute. Then his weakness is revealed in his weakness toward the Word of God. Now, Samson's a judge. If you read this, you know that. He judges the people. He understands the law. He's read the law. He is able to apply the law. He is able to help people with their difficulties with the law. But he himself has a problem with the law, which is the word of God. Though he knows it, he doesn't apply it to his own life. One of the saddest things in the world is to find people who have been going to church all their life, sitting in Sunday school all their life, been taught from the Word of God by the pastor for years and years, and yet they don't apply the Word of God into their own life. They know to do good, but they don't do good. What does the Bible say about a man like that? He who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Absolutely. So here's a man who's got evidence of his weakness in character because he knows the Bible, he knows the Word, but he will not let the Word form his own life. He says, I'm going to do it my way, when I want to, however I want to, that's what I'm going to do. If you've got struggles like that, dear friend, you just know today you're headed for trouble, just like Samson. Thirdly, his weakness is revealed in his failure to submit to his parents. Now you see here Samson, he, he, by the way, he's a product of prayer. Now some of us are just an accident, but this guy is a product of prayer. His mama says, Lord, I want a baby. And an angel comes and says, don't give you one. And uh, go tell your husband so he can get in on this too. Y'all go have a baby. And so he was born as a son of promise and blessing from God, and they had wanted a child so badly, they did something that parents often do. They spoiled him. I knew a man in my young years. He had two sons. He said, when the first one came, we wore out the rocker trying to satisfy him. When the second one came, we wore out the son and saved the rocker. And so a lot of folks have fallen into situations where they just spoil the child. And usually a spoiled child becomes known as a brat. That's right. A brat. A spoiled brat. Now, this Samson is a spoiled kid. By the way, Samson in today's English, a good interpretation of that word is sunny boy. And so here's mama. She's just loving on her little boy. Sonny, and she just loves him and encourages him, and uh, he gets anything he wants, except now they've been telling him all of his life, God's got a special plan for you, and you need to seek the Lord, you need to study the Bible, you need to keep yourself from, and they told him all the things that he couldn't do because he was sworn to the Nazarite vow, and so Samson was to perform the works of God. But he was spoiled, 
He was soiled, he was selfish, and he became a sarcastic man because of the kind of things that had been allowed in his own home. But what his weakness in character is, eventually produces sin in his life. Now, what did, how was this sin evidenced? First of all, it was evidenced by his rebellion against God. Now, folks, I want you to know that what Samson does in his desire for this woman and the other things that he does is it's an evidence of the sin of his life, his rebellion against God, which is just as great as the rebellion that Adam and Eve had against God when they ate the forbidden fruit. Some of you here today, you know what God says. You know what the Word of God teaches. You know what you ought to be doing, and yet you're rebelling against God. I don't know what area of your life it's showing up, but I understand, understand me, dear friend, that sin against God is rebellion against God, and rebellion against God is sin against God. And sin separates you from God, and any sin that's in your life needs to be dealt with so that you can be clean, so that God can fill you, and so that God can make your life a usable vessel in his kingdom. Most of us, however, we justify our sin. We want to say, well, I just do that because Samson did that. He always blamed somebody else. It wasn't his fault. It was always somebody else. But he had rebelled against God. Then he had rebelled against his home. And as a result of that, he ended up hurting others to make himself feel better about himself. And a lot of times, the way that people uh, uh, do, especially if their sin is indicted, they will lash out at somebody else and they'll hurt those who love them the most. And some of you here today know exactly what I'm talking about. While I was away in revival, a lady came to clean my room. And... Uh, I opened the door and she said, uh, I'm here to clean your room. I said, well, come on in. We opened the curtain and, and so anybody could see, left the door open. And I was studying at the time she came, so I just sat back down and, and continued to study while she went about doing whatever she had to do. But in a little while, she worked her way back around toward where I was and I began to talk with her about her own relationship with God. You see, I believe that we ought to tell everybody we can about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, she was 48 years of age, and she began to tell me the story of her life, how that she had uh, married young, had reared children, had lost her husband, had a boyfriend, they lost everything. She was back home living with Mama and just describing a, a, a life of sadness. As she talked about it, I found myself just sitting there weeping because of where she's been. And she said, the reason I've done all this was that my dad, from the time I was a young girl till I was an older teenager, my dad molested me. And then he began to physically abuse me. And as soon as I could, I left home. But you see, while she was pointing at her dad, the, all of that disgrace and shame in her life had produced a woman who was afraid to trust herself or anybody else. But as I shared the gospel of the Lord Jesus with her and told her how that he who dwells in us then brings his life to our life, and there she, she sat down in the seat opposite me and we prayed together and she invited Jesus to come into her heart. When she had prayed, she jumped up, grabbed me, and hugged me, and said, I got to go tell somebody, and left the room. Well, the next morning, she came to clean the room, and she was all smiles. She walked in the room and said, hey, Reverend Jones, hey, I went home and told Mama. And she started telling me about all the things that she had shared and how good God is and what God had done in changing her life. Sin had its control, but God can break the chains of sin that bind you. And so Samson is weak, and Samson is in sin, and Samson has a problem that manifests itself in a lot of different ways, and one of them is Samson, when he is rebuffed, now goes on a rampage. I mean, here is a guy who uh, just loses it. If you go back to chapter 14 of our uh, text in Judges, you'll find that there's, first of all, broken promises. And so his wife, you remember, uh, he had a little riddle that he had given to her. And Now, gossip 
miracles and say, now don't you tell anybody. The only reason I'm telling you this is so you can pray about it. And you're saying, boy, I can't wait. You heard about the three preachers that went fishing and they're out in the boat and while they're sitting there, nothing's going on. Fish aren't biting. And it was a Methodist, a Catholic, and a Baptist. And the Catholic, the Catholic priest said, since there's nothing going on, I might just tell you, I've got a problem. I've got a problem with drinking, and, and I don't know what to do about it, and I love it, and he went on to describe it. And when he had finished, the Methodist said, well, I've got a problem too. He said, I've got a problem with women. And I've been carrying on an affair, and I, I hate for uh, anybody to know it, but as my brothers, I'm just telling you. And the Baptist just sat there. Finally, they said, now we've confessed our weaknesses to you. Are you not going to confess? He said, yes, I do have a problem. I have a problem with gossip, and I can't wait to get back to the bank so I can start telling all that you've told me. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, but his wife, told everybody and she ended up as a source of destroying and so If you can't figure it out, then you have to, all 30 of you, buy me a new suit. And so when they couldn't figure it out, they went to his wife and begged her and said, if you don't tell us, we're going to come, we're going to kill you, your mama, your daddy, we're going to burn your house down, and we're, uh, you've got to tell us. And so she, out of her situation, went to him, to Samson, and began to cry. Now, ladies, understand, the Bible in the book of Proverbs talks about a weeping woman and uh, uh, this woman just begins to play on his sympathy and she weeps and she weeps and she weeps and, and nothing will satisfy her till he tells her the riddle. And he don't get out of the room until she goes to her friends and she tells them the riddle. And they come back and reveal and now he's got to go buy 30 suits for these guys. And he don't have any money. He's already spent it on the party they've been having. So what do you do? He goes down to the next town and he waylays 30 guys, murders them, strips them of their clothes, leaves them naked and takes those up and he pays off his debt with the clothes that he stole from those men. You see, when, when sin's in your life, oftentimes it'll break out in a rampage. What seemed to be in control, what seemed to be something that you could handle suddenly will get out of hand and it'll come to destroy you. And then in order just to make things tough, he went out and he caught uh, foxes and he tied their tails together and put a, a brand, uh, tied a burning uh, ember uh, to their tails and then turned them loose so that they'd go out through the fields and they would burn the uh, fields up. 300 foxes tied together, 150 pairs of fire brands that he unleashes. Samson would be in trouble today, boy. The, a the ASPCA or whatever that is, boy, they'd be mad at him because he was uh, cruel to animals. And then the environmentalist would be mad at him because he's burning up all of the crops and putting all that smoke up in the air. Everywhere Samson turns, he's in trouble with somebody. And folks, that's the way the devil will do you today. You may think you've got everything in control, but when you let Satan loose in your life, it won't be long until everything begins to go wrong in your life. He went on a rampage. Oh, by the way, in chapter 14, verse 20, did you see who got his wife? The best man. That's right. Scripture says whom he had used as his, as his friend, that was his best man and he had at his wedding. And so the best man steals the wife away. Now that's a good friend for you. I mean just uh, uh, he'll steal your woman. So now here's Samson. The woman that he wanted is gone. His best friend has turned against him. His wife had turned against him. And every way he turned, there's nothing but trouble because sin unleashed in your life will give nothing but trouble. And now, 
I want you to look at one other thing. He is weak. He is weak in his commitment. He had no stick to itiveness. He didn't know what to do to stay by the stuff. Look at what he did. Now, this is a man who knows the law. He murdered his enemies to pay a debt. And then he stole his clo their clothes. That's two of the commandments that he broke. He laid with a prostitute, chapter 16, verse 1, committed adultery. That is another commandment. He wanted a wife he should not have, covetousness. That is another law that he broke. He rebelled against parents, honor thy father and thy mother. And so he just keeps on breaking the commandments of God. As a matter of fact, Samson broke, if I count it anywhere near right, at least six of the Ten Commandments. A woman was sending a Bible to her family member through the mail, and so when she had it packaged up, she took it down, and the postman was weighing it, and as he's getting ready to put the postage on it, he says, is there anything in here that will break? And the lady said, nothing except the Ten Commandments. And folks, I want you to know that the law is given to us not to bind us, but to set us free. And yet it's a code that God has given to us that each of us are to seek to follow in our own life. He broke the commandments. Now, why did he fail? And I believe he is a failure. First of all, because he had a desire to be liked by everyone. Here's a guy that's been brought up to be different, and yet he wants everybody to love him. And folks, I want you to understand that there are some things that you can have that you don't want to pay the price in order to get. And Samson learned that the hard way. He wanted to be liked by everyone. Now, there's some people that won't like you. I can't understand it really, but there's some people that don't like me. One fellow said that even the family dog didn't like him. He said the family had to tie a pork chop around his neck to get the dog to look at, love him and lick him. But I want you to know the drug crowd don't like me. And the booze peddlers don't like me. And people who want to engage in all sorts of illicit things don't like me because I'm too straight for them. But I'd rather be straight and right with God than to be liked by the whole world. But there are some people that won't like you. But he wanted everybody to like him. By the way, the Bible says, Beware when all men speak well of you. Because when you're living in the light of God's holy word, there will be some folks that will not want to be around you. One fellow said, I'd get saved, preacher, but I have to give up too many of my friends. I said, no, you won't. You won't have to give up one. But when you get saved, they'll give you up. They don't want you at their parties, and they don't want you around. They'll shun you. You won't have to give them up. He failed also because of his willingness to fraternize with the enemy. God had said that these were his enemies, and yet Samson wanted to embrace those who hated God. Also, he failed because he refused to come out from among them. The Bible says that we are to come out from among them and be a separated people. Now listen, friend, one of the reasons that the church of today is not having an impact upon the world is because we've become so much like the world that you can't tell the world from us or us from the world. And God says we're to come out from among them. That doesn't mean that you have to act an idiot or be a fool, but it does mean that you're not to adopt the ways of the world or to be with the people of the world, but you're to share the light of God with the world. And so God says, come out. Samson said, no, I want to be liked by everybody. I want to be a part of what they're doing. And then he failed because he didn't seek God and he didn't pray. If you read the story of him, you don't find him until...
that are the greatest experiences in my life. If when, it's when I have fasted and gone into retreat. Some time back, my uh, wife was going to accompany the choir on a choir retreat. Now, I like to go with them. I like just to hang out uh, with folks like that, our choir, and uh, not interfere with their rehearsal, but just to be there. But I had several things that were pressing on me at the time that I had to hear from heaven. I needed a word from God. So I called a friend who lives over near the Savannah River, near Augusta, Georgia. He's got a little uh, farm, and he's got a farm pond, and he's built a house down beside of that. It's far removed. Nobody ever comes. There's not a telephone down there. And so I said to him, uh, can I use your house? I just need to come for a couple of days so that I can fast and pray. I don't want to talk to other people. I just want to be able to come and be by myself. So he agreed, and I drove over there, and I took my Bible, took a few other books that I wanted to study from, and I went in with all these things in my life that I needed direction from God. I needed to have a word, an answer from God. And so I, I shut myself away, and I was fasting, and I began to pray. And I prayed all that afternoon, and God didn't answer. And I prayed all that evening, and God didn't answer. And I was studying my Bible, reading and praying, seeking God. I prayed into the night, finally went to bed, got up the next morning before the sun, and got outside just walking around, calling on God. And God didn't answer. But a little while later, my friend God came. And God met with me, and what God spoke to my heart then, I have seen the fruit of in my own life in so many ways, I can't even tell you. But folks, you need to get alone with God. My study at the house is in the upper part of our house, in the attic. And uh, I go up there. My wife usually doesn't bother me when I'm in my study because I'm just up there with God. And many times I just prostrate myself on the floor as I, as I lay there and I pray and beg God and hold on to the altar of God until God comes through. And I'm going to tell you, folks, it's in those times you say, well, I can't do that. I can't go on retreat. I don't have a study that I can go into. You know what the Bible says? Enter into your closet. Amen. And when you shut the door, pray to your Father, in secret, and your Father who hears in secret shall reward thee openly. You say, well, I don't even have a closet I can get in. Well, you might consider something else. John Wesley's mother made it a habit of every day spending one hour in prayer. One hour every day in her closet in prayer. By the way, that's quite a task when you've got 15 children. I heard about a woman, they were paving a road near her house. She had 15 children. And she said to those children, now don't you get out there and get that tar on you. I'll never be able to get it off. Well, one of them did anyhow. Got it all over him. And she got him in the wash house trying to scrub him down, get that tar off. And in her exasperation, she said, I could sooner have another one than to clean this one up. And so... <laughs> Ms. Wesley said, I want to spend that time. She had that hard and fast rule. The children knew to sit down and be quiet. They didn't disturb mother when she was praying. If one of them was sick and she was sitting by their bedside and couldn't go to that room, she'd just take her apron and put it up over her head and spend that hour every day with God. Is it any wonder that her boys went on to become men who would change? the world and most of her children became people of note who married into some of the top people in the country of England and who uh, were members of the legislature and so on because this woman had prayed God down. Samson finally in his, de in his need after they're out to kill him, the whole nation of the Philistines are against him. He gets alone and he seeks God. Verse 8, he sought the Lord. He retreated to seek God. But then after he has, they come and get him and tie him up, his own people, and don't turn him over to the Philistines. He said, I'll go with you if you'll just promise that you won't kill me yourself. They said, we're not going to bother you. They put new rope on him, took him down, and on the way down, now the enemy begins to fight against him, to shout against him. They're going to take his life. And God comes on him. When God comes on him, the ropes are like ropes that have been burned with fire and they just snap off of his wrist. And he picks up a jawbone 
of a recently dead donkey and he takes that jawbone and that becomes a weapon and with that one jawbone he kills a thousand men and he sings verse 16 a song and says with the jawbone of an ass heaps upon heaps with the jawbone of an ass have I slain a thousand men you see folks what I'm trying to say to you is that anybody under the anointing and the power of God can stand against an enemy and God will give you victory. And here is a man who in his own strength has been defeated over and over. Now in the strength of God, he's able to overcome all the enemies that have come against him. And then verse 18, he's about to die of thirst and he cries out for relief and God makes a cleft in the rock and water comes out. And there Samson finds the water that gives him new strength and he goes on with God. Samson realized he was nothing without God. An atheist was taunting a preacher and he said to that preacher, you Christians are just a bunch of weaklings. Just a bunch of weaklings. You can't stand on your own feet. You can't do anything unless you have Jesus. And the preacher said, you got that right. Folks, we can't do anything without Jesus. We need him every hour. And unless he is with us, folks, we're the ones who are going to be defeated. But with him by our side, we have the victory in everything in our life. The preacher said, or the atheist said again, why you Christians are just weaklings. Said, you're just looking for a way out. He said, right again. Because, friend, the, uh, the out that we're looking for is the one that's going to take us out of this world. And I'm telling you that I'm praying that Jesus is going to come. Wouldn't it be great if he just decided to come today? And if he's waiting for an invitation, I and some more of you here would probably say, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Even now, come, Lord. Well, Samson found his strength when he found the Lord. Samson found his power when he found the Lord. Samson found his deliverance when he found the Lord. And you too will find him and find your need fulfilled when you seek the Lord. As long as you're trying to do like Samson in those early days, doing it yourself, you're always going to be defeated. And what may seem to be the right way to go will always produce the wrong result as long as you're doing it in the flesh. But what may seem to be contrary to the ways of man will be the right thing if, when you're doing your th deeds according to God. God will never lead you wrong. Some of you came here this day and you came with a life in total disarray, just like Samson. You tried everything in your own strength only to find nothing but failure. Everywhere you turn. Will you try Jesus, man of Galilee? He'll never fail you. And where you're weak, he is strong. Trust him. And you'll see. Let's bow our heads. Father, speak to the heart of this people. Teach us all, Lord, that we have no strength without your strength. We have no answer lest you will give us a word. And some of my people today are struggling, struggling with things that are so heavy that they feel like they can't even go on beyond this day. But I ask you that you will come and make known to every heart the answers of their life and that they can be found in Jesus Christ. For that brother here today who is under such a burden that unless God comes through, he'll never be able to stand. God, help him to seek your face. For that dear sister here today, who is under the gun and feels like her whole world is crumbling down around her, help her to see, Lord, that the resurrected life of Christ is still available to those who seek him. For that one here who is just a heartbeat out of hell, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll draw them today. And may they come to know you as Savior and Lord of their life. I lay before you this congregation and pray, Holy Spirit, draw them by your power in Jesus Christ. Amen.